Thank you. Um, I'd like to talk today about uh, incoherency, forward control, and bacteria-based life economy. Um, it's actually kind of fancy um, jargon and hack, but kind of a very simple phenomenon, and I'll talk about that in a second. The general focus of my lab is to look at the mechanism and um, means in which precision and gene expression is controlled. So if you are producing certain proteins to generate cellular events, the proteins must be expressed to very precise numbers in order to have precision control. And if you have imprecise control, you have noise in gene expression, bad things can happen. As our model, we use bacteriophages, which are very simple organisms, very easy to manipulate in the lab, and um, for those of you who aren't totally familiar with the life cycle of these organisms, they generally infect the bacterial cell by attaching to the capsid. They inject their DNA into the capsid. And in the case of the organism that I talk about today, bacteriophage lambda, it can either take one of two developmental paths. In one path, the DNA can integrate itself into the genome of the E. coli host, and then it will replicate alongside that host. In the second pathway, the protein uh, directly expressed from that um, bacteriophage DNA, the progeny will be assembled from those proteins, and at a genetically encoded time, the bacteriophage will burst open the host and release the progeny to infect new host types. And they can go from the lysogenic stage, which we call when it's integrated into the genome, to the lytic phase when the proper environmental cues are given. So I use the bacterial phase <coughs> lambda. Essentially, two important proteins are produced enabling the bacterial phase to lyse the host cell. They're called holin and endolysin. The whole one here is in the blue, and I show it accumulating in the cell membrane. And it's an inner membrane of bacteria. Outside of that, we have a layer of peptidyl glycan, and then we also have an outer membrane. But this uh, whole one is accumulating in the inner membrane. The endolysin is going to accumulate in the cytoplasm. And then over time, the proteins are being cracked. The whole one will reach a critical concentration in the inner membrane where it nucleates, makes a pore or hole, through which the endolysin can be released with digestive peptidoglycan glycan causes the cell to lyse. And this is a very dramatic, easily identifiable event, which I show here in a movie. But it's the E. coli cell that is being burst open by bacterial base. So it's very dramatic and easy to see. And for that reason, I've chosen it as the event in which I am looking at the stochastic expression of these two proteins in order to light the cell. And what we're able to do is to develop a mathematical model to see what the expression of these proteins in a stochastic manner will give rise to a distribution of license time and standard deviation, and we're able to make predictions regarding whether to manipulate various elements of the control of gene expression, what will happen to the lysis time and the variation of lysis time. And then we're able to go back, experimentally test these hypotheses using um, this setup here, which I won't go into detail, but we essentially look at a single cell over time following induction, which we're able to induce the phase to life by using a temperature spike. And then you see when the cell disappears, we're able to say this cell lies in 60 minutes, maybe another one in 55, another one in 65, and you get the mean of distribution. Interestingly, um, when we started studying it, we realized there was some hidden complexity in the system. What the simple would be, first thought. <coughs> the hidden complexity 
lies in the next covalent protein. In fact, there are two proteins that collect from the same open reading plane. They have two stop codons. If the uh, ribosome should bind to the first stop codon here, it will make the 105 amino acid protein, which we call holin. Occasionally, it will bind to this stop codon here and make a 107 amino acid protein, which we call anti -holin. The reason for that is that the anti forms a two transmembrane domain structure in the membrane, whereas the holin <laughs> makes a three transmembrane domain structure. Only the three transmembrane domain structure is able to participate in hole formation. And not only that, but the anti-holin cannot participate in hole formation also bind the holon and remove it from the equation. Once the holon is bound by anti holon it can no longer make uh, a hole. The control of how these two uh, proteins are expressed is regulated by a hairpin in the mRNA upstream of the two stop codon. When this hairpin See the self complementarity here. When the hairpin is closed, then initiation starts from this MET codon. When the hairpin is relaxed, initiation can start up here. And because of the nature of the mRNA, two S105 molecules are made for every antiholin made. So that means that out of every three molecule of uh, protein extract from this operon, the two are functionally inactive. And this is also very significant because the dual star motif has been identified at least a quarter of the base lysis system. And this actually may be an underestimate because I took this data from a paper that was published about 10 years ago. Anyway. Here's some more details about the how holon and anti holon interact and cause lysis. I show here the holon molecule in the yellow. Um, I put in the green area to represent a hydrophilic region. So when the two species, the two proteins, um, assemble in the membrane, they tend to dimerize with those hydrophilic regions coming together. <laughs> And then I show here the holon molecule also dimerizing with the anti holon region. So two to one, they're being compressed, so we only have a, um, one anti holon for the two holon molecules produced. And now, at this stage, um, there's an electrical force in the membrane that is preventing this um, end terminal end of the protein from accessing that three dimensional shape because this lice residue here has a very strong positive charge which prevents it from crossing the negatively charged membrane. The hole and the anti hole will continue to accumulate in the membrane. Once the critical concentration is released, which we believe those polar bases, the hydrophilic bases, will all orientate inwards. Therefore, a small pore is formed in the membrane. And once that happens, hydrogen protons are able to flow back down their concentration gradient. And the proton motor force is destroyed, at least locally, which allows the antipolin to now participate in hole formation. Because at this point, membrane is no longer negatively charged. So now you have these proteins participating, but the really interesting question for me when I found out about this thing is that two-thirds of the output of this operon is at least initially functionally inactive. And there have been a few 
speculation about this system. Um, most people in the molecular biology who basically don't look at things in an evolutionary way because they took it for granted that, oh yeah, we could you know, produce these proteins and they don't really seem to do much. Um, one hypothesis was that the colon appeared to be a fine tuning <coughs> system for the extension of lysine. Well, from our data, we show that you can adjust the timing of lysis and fine tune it by adjusting the burst size, which is the number of protein produced per mRNA molecule, or you can um, manipulate the colon threshold concentration, the threshold concentration that it needs to reach in order to burst the cell organ. So you, this hypothesis did not seem to be true. The second one was that colon confers on the lysis system an all or nothing character. The word you, the saltatory nature of lysis. Well, we also showed that if you abolish anticolon, it will move it. It does not cause any excessive delay, and it does not alter or impair the lysis ability. So those two don't seem to really explain why we have anticolon. The one principle of evolutionary biology adhere to, and that nature is not propagated. It's not wasteful. There should be a strong selective reason why you are functionally inactivating two thirds of the output of this gene to a very certain time. That is because proteins that are most energetically expensive molecules to produce, bacteria babies are the most um, stingiest of all organisms when it comes to producing, um, using up their resources, so that these previous theories are unable to provide a significant benefit. So why do babies have this rude Goldbergian life system? Maybe it has something to do with the um, bacteria phase assembly dynamics. The phage exit the genome around this time, the transcription is initiated around this time. We can first light the cell <coughs> open with an energy poison around 28 minutes. So that means at that point, colon has reached its uh, concentration sufficient to light the cell. The first progeny are only seen about 30 minutes, and then at 65 minutes, we have um, lysis after the project have accumulated for that period of time. The key here is that if the cell should lice any time in an early period, it's going to kill the bacterial phage without the bacterial phage leaving any project to so a suicidal. So that gives you one clue. Perhaps this system is an incoherent feed forward circuit and what that means is that the promoter produces two proteins of opposite effect, meaning be, uh, incoherent. And then the feed forward means that the anticolon will block the activity of the holon. And the hypothesis we have is that anticolon buffers against stochastic variation in gene expression, prevents premature lysis without Reducing the expression of the polycystic structural genes that are also expressed in the same arbor. So you're able to maximize expression without reducing, um, or without chanting early lysis before the progeny have been assembled. There's some data for this in which we see the, we have removed the first dot codon, that uh, anti -hopeland. The amount of variation for these cells is much greater than the variation we see in the wild type. The second hypothesis, I think, is that anticholins protect against premature cell death. So if the cell should die before the bacterial phage has liked the cell, you have a whole bunch of progeny inside the cell that needs to be freed. So they're trapped in the drive core. The cell dies. PMF is removed, the anticholin is converted to holin, giving the cell enough 
active hole that lies open that cell prematurely in the dead cell, releasing their um, dead cell from that host. So those are my two conclusions. These two hypotheses are not mutually exclusive, and they might in fact complement each other. I'll stop there. I just want to thank the members of my lab and my collaborators. I'll take any questions if you want before you run out of coffee. Thank you very much.